Hey all and welcome to another awesome tutorial. Rivers and waterfalls are always an attention grabber on model train layouts and dioramas. So in this video, I'll step you through the process of building a really cool and super realistic waterfall. It's much easier than you think, so follow along as this awesome scene comes to life. The starting point for this diorama is the bridge, which is also available as a free download on my website for those who want to build one as well. The bridge was designed using Tinkercad and is loosely modelled off the bridge at Multnomah Falls in Oregon. When it comes to 3D modelling basic 3D shapes, Tinkercad is just about as easy as it gets. Once you master the basics, you can pretty much model any structure. Once finished modelling the bridge in Tinkercad, it is brought into the 3D printing slicing software where it has supports added so that it can be 3D printed. To print the bridge, I used the Nova 3D Whale 3D printer. Because the bridge has very fine detail, you want to use a good resin 3D printer so the detail will print accurately. Preparing the 3D printed parts is just like any other plastic kit. You'll want some snips, files, sandpaper and a sharp hobby knife. Resin parts sand very easily compared to plastic and wood, which is great for sanding away any unwanted imperfections. However, it's just as easy to accidentally sand away too much and remove detail unintentionally. Resin is also quite brittle, so it's important to treat delicate parts with care. I accidentally dropped the bridge and damaged it during the construction of this project, but the beauty of printing it yourself is if you do damage it, beyond repair, you can simply 3D print a new bridge. The bridge was printed in separate parts to make painting easier. Also to save on printer resin, the walkway is made by attaching a strip of 0.5mm styrene sheet to the side rails. The easiest way to glue the styrene and resin together is by using epoxy. The epoxy adheres quite well to both styrene and resin. In preparation for painting, the parts are cleaned in water to remove resin dust from the sanding and any other dirt and grime from being handled. Once dry, the parts are primed with some grey primer. The bridge is a cement type bridge, so the painting consists of a warm cement grey. This particular colour is the Woodland Scenic Cement Paint that is thinned down so it would spray through the airbrush. Once the initial colour has been applied evenly over both the walkway section and the arch, they are ready for the texture layer. The texture is added by turning the airbrush airflow down very low so the paint leaves a speckled pattern. This speckled layer is added right across the surface of the bridge. Once covered, another layer of the Woodland Scenic Cement colour is misted over the top very thinly so the texture underneath is still visible. To add some shadow effects, I'm using an oil wash using Starship Filth mixed with thinners. This wash is applied over the entire bridge and helps bring out the fine details in the crevices and edges. It also gives the bridge an older aged concrete look. Once dry, the bridge can be assembled. Before gluing, I make sure to remove the paint from the areas where the two parts will press together. This ensures the parts glue together a little better with less risk of the two parts separating later. Epoxy is used to glue the two parts together. Printer resin does have a tendency to warp as it can be seen here, so it will often be necessary to weigh or clamp the parts together as the glue cures. A final bit of weathering is added using some more oil paint and weathering powders. Streaking effects using the oil paint are done by adding a small drop in the desired spot and gently dragging a soft brush that has been dipped in thinners across the oil paint. Powders are used to give a softer streaking effect and smudges. To lock everything down, the bridge is misted with Tamiya matte spray paint. In the end, the bridge was just a touch darker than I wanted so another very light misting of the Woodland Scenic Cement was applied as a final layer. Now onto the diorama base. Like many of my previous dioramas, the dimensions are chosen so that the model will fit on the table you can see in the background. It's basically a display area for my most recent dioramas. It's a simple pine construction 
and it has foam glued inside to create the base to build upon. The foam is extruded polystyrene and is great for using as a base to build upon. It's also perfect for building up terrain and contours as well, which we'll be doing very soon. This particular brand also cuts very well when using hot wire tools. For a good strong hold when gluing, I like to use polyurethane glue. It takes a few hours to set, but once it's set, it won't go anywhere. Now for building up the mountain. The same foam is used again to create a real basic shape. When using polyurethane, be sure to weigh it down as it cures because it will expand and move the foam if it's not secured in one way or another. For odd pieces like these bridge support pieces, it's not always possible to use weights. So in this case, I'm using some bamboo skewers to hold the foam in place. Once the glue is set, the excess is trimmed away. In preparation for terrain, I cast a whole heap of plaster rocks. A lot of the hillside will be covered in rocks so I needed quite a lot in order to fill out the scene. Before starting I'm using a real location as a reference. For this lower section I'm demonstrating how to build up the train with scrunched up paper and tape. This is one of the easiest methods and allows for the most freedom when it comes to manipulating the scene to get just the look you want. You can add more paper as desired, you can squash areas down as needed, and you can remove paper if it's not exactly what you want. You can also wet the paper to get even more control if you want. To give it the hard shell it needs, I use Sculpt-It Modeling Mix from Officeworks. This stuff is awesome for scenes like this. It gets mixed to a thick paste-like consistency. Once thoroughly mixed, it's ready to be applied to the scene. A light spritzing of water will help it stick to the paper. Next, the plaster is slapped on and manipulated as necessary, gradually building up areas as desired. It's very easy to work with, and when mixed just right, it will hold its shape really well, meaning you can build it up vertically, and even create overhanging areas and make caves and tunnels as well. While the plaster is still wet and soft, the rocks are soaked in water and then pressed into place. I press them down quite hard so they sink into the wet plaster a little, and then I blend the area around the rocks so that it looks embedded into the ground. Don't be afraid to break the rocks as needed so they fit a little better into place. This process is repeated right across the surface until you get the look you're after. As the plaster gradually sets, but before it's completely dry, I carve and sculpt the modelling mix so that it looks like rocks and blends seamlessly with the pre-made rock moulds. Adding in some deep cracks and strata lines helps blend between the rocks and helps bring the scene together. It can be a little time consuming, but the results make a really big difference. Now for the top. This section I'll use the foam and hot wire technique. The first step is to add the foam, using the polyurethane glue and bamboo skewers to hold it in place. Once the foam is down, we can start to create the contours in the foam. For that I'm using the Hot Wire Foam Factory Hot Knife. This is the longer one so that I can get right through the foam and cut out large sections at a time. It's a slow process, especially when cutting through high density foam and cutting through large sections like this. With this style of contouring, you want to go slow so that you will avoid accidentally cutting away too much foam and you can just make small cuts at a time, gradually removing foam until you're left with the hillside you want. Now to address those large gaps. They are simply covered with some tape, so that when the plaster is applied, we don't waste any plaster sinking down into those gaps. The rest is basically the same as the lower section. Adding the Sculpt-It modeling mix, then adding rock molds, and then finally carving in additional rock detail to tie it all together. After leaving it to dry overnight, the next day I mix up a very soupy mix of plaster of Paris. This is going to be used to seal the riverbed as it will have resin added later. 
After wetting the surface, the plaster is poured and then I used my finger to push the mixture around so that it completely covers the riverbed. The plaster fills in all the little holes in the foam and also helps give the riverbed a nice smooth surface. When it comes to colouring the rocks, I'm using the Woodland Scenics Leopard Spotting Technique, starting with a general covering of raw umber. Covering about 70% of the diorama with this colour and laying it on quite heavily so the mixture runs down into the cracks of the rocks. The rest of the white is covered using yellow ochre with pretty much the same technique. Some areas had a touch more raw umber added to dull down the yellow. A hairdryer is used to help speed up the drying process. Once dry, a heavily diluted black is applied over the entire area. This helps give it a more grey stone look and darkens the cracks and crevices between the rocks giving it a lot more definition. To add more colour, Vallejo Light Mud is dry brushed over the rocks. It's quite a heavy dry brush and was used to give the rocks a colour that I was happy with, while also showing the variations in colour from the earlier applications of the wash that were applied. Lastly, some off-white is dry brushed over the rocks as well. This helps bring out the edge detail of the rocks and gives artificial highlights helping them stand out much better, especially when viewed from indoor lighting. This is a much lighter dry brushing compared to the mud colour, so you want to avoid overdoing the white because too much can ruin the effect. The riverbed is coloured with a grey around the edges, being careful not to get any overspray onto the rocks we just painted. The deeper sections of the river are coloured using a dark sea grey. This simulates depth when in reality there is none. I also darken the rocks along the path of the waterfall. These areas of rocks would naturally be darker due to the water flowing over them. This is achieved by dry brushing some grey. Once that's dry, some of the black wash is applied to darken them further and bring back the detail. And finally, I very lightly again go back over them with some off-white to highlight the edges. Now for some dirt. This is backyard dirt mixed with beige coloured grout. By varying the grout to dirt ratio, you can get slight variations in colour in your dirt. In order to get the dirt to stick onto the steep sections, I first brush over some diluted Mod Podge only covering the areas you want dirt to stick to. Next the dirt is sprinkled across the model. I'm letting some of the dirt cascade down the hillside naturally. Some of the dirt will fall and sit on these small ledges and onto some of the protruding rocks which would happen in nature as well. Excess dirt is removed using a large soft brush. I carefully dust away the dirt from some of the rock faces for example, there would be very little dirt on the rocks directly under the waterfall. I also remove excess dirt from the riverbed as well, either pushing it onto the sides or completely brushing it off the edge of the diorama. All that dirt is sealed down permanently using a misting of isopropyl alcohol shortly followed with diluted Mod Podge. Any excess glue can be soaked up with a paper towel. Just trying to be careful not to scratch or rub away the paint. Static grass comes next and makes one of the biggest changes to the look of the diorama so far. Because the scene represents a lush watery paradise, I'm using a medium and dark green mix with some colours combined from Woodland Scenics as well as Warworld Scenics to give a nice natural variation in colour. The grass is applied using the Woodland Scenic Static King and has to be my favourite applicator so far. Just plug in the grounding pin and power cord so that it's ready to go. Add glue. In this case I'm using full strength Mod Podge mat. Dab the glue in the areas you want grass. The glue gets soaked up into the dirt quite fast and will dry quickly so I only work in small areas at a time. Then just turn the applicator on, hold the grounding clip close to the glued area and shake the applicator over the glue about 3-4 to four centimeters above the surface. Like magic, the grass will stick to the glue and stand on end giving a very realistic looking grass effect. 
As for removing the excess, just hold a piece of stocking over the end of the vacuum, suck up the excess and put it back into the static grass hopper so that it can be used on other areas of the diorama. These steps are continued across the model until all the desired areas are covered. Low-lying bushes and weeds are added using a variety of ground foams from Woodland Scenics. I tend to use the medium green and burnt grass colours most, while only using a very small amount of the light green for a bit of colour variety. Just like the grass, glue is applied to areas we want the green foam to stick to. Then with a small amount of foam, it is pressed into the glue so that it sticks in place. I try to follow natural cracks and crevices in the rocks where you might see some vegetation growing in real life. Once you're happy with the coarse foam, I come back and lightly sprinkle some fine turf burnt grass over the top. This helps bring together the varying colours making them look a bit more natural and beds them in with the surrounding grass and rocks. Once happy, the scene is misted once again with some isopropyl alcohol and scenic glue. Excess glue can be washed away from the rocks using alcohol and soaked up with a paper towel. Unfortunately, I went a bit heavy with the paper towel here, but a quick touch up with the airbrush was an easy fix. Now for the real fun, adding water. I say fun, but also it's the most nerve wracking part as well, because a lot can go wrong. To dam up the lower section I'm using some acrylic sheet. It's cut to size and a bead of hot glue is used to seal the edges. You want a good clean bead with no gaps because the resin will leak out of even the smallest of holes. To dam the top I'm using a thick bead of hot glue. The uneven surface makes it very hard to use the acrylic but it's also only a shallow body of water here so a bead of glue should be enough. The water is done with Aldax Crystal Cast. It's an epoxy resin. As always, just make sure to have a level table before pouring so that it doesn't pull up one end. It's a two to one mix ratio, which is common with epoxy resin, but make sure to read the instructions of the resin you are using because some are different. Also when adding color, it's best to use pigments designed for epoxy so you get the best result. I found mixing the color in part A first works well, but it's up to you when to add the color. To get a nice murky blue, I add some raw umber mixed with blue. The blue is very strong pigment, so only a small amount was needed. Once the two parts are combined, it's mixed thoroughly for about five minutes before pouring. It's carefully poured on the three levels, doing my best to avoid getting drips on unwanted areas of the diorama. Unfortunately, right where there was a join in the two pieces of pine that make up the frame of the base, there was a small leak. To slow the leak down, I pressed some paper towel up against the leak and left it there as the resin started curing. There's not a whole lot you can do for a leak except to slow it down. With the remaining resin, I painted some over the areas directly behind the waterfall to simulate wet rocks. As the epoxy cures, it gets quite hot. You can see the steam rising out from the cup. The deeper the pour is, the hotter it will get, which can lead to issues like this. A large heat bubble formed just below the surface, which was easy enough to pop, but you can also see the surface started to ripple a little bit. But again, I was lucky that it was below the waterfall in a spot where you would expect to see rough water. Basically, the depth of the pour was a little bit too deep on the bottom section, which resulted in these issues. Now it's left overnight so the epoxy resin can cure. Once cured, the acrylic is removed. To free the hot glue, I soak it with a few drops of isopropyl alcohol. This helps release the glue in one piece from the wood, leaving a nice clean surface. The resin soaked paper towel was a bit harder to remove but after a while of picking and cutting, I managed to get it all off. The feature that really makes this diorama pop is the waterfall. To build up the shape of the falls, I used some silver aluminium florist's wire. I also had some white cloth wire, 
that the aluminium wire proved to be the easiest to work with. A piece of wire is cut to length and shaped with some pliers. The wire is also quite easy to work with your fingers as well. Once you've got the desired shape, the wire is tacked down with a drop of hot glue so that it won't move as we continue to work on the waterfall. Only a few pieces of wire will be needed to build up the general shape and structure of the waterfall. Once the bottom is done, the same applies for the top waterfall as well. Next, the wire has some hobby tack applied. This glue, once applied, will dry clear and remain tacky so that anything that touches it should stick pretty well. A little bit of glue is also applied across the top of the fall and across the base as well. For the main flowing water, I'm using polyfiber, the stuff used to fill pillows. This is actually somewhere I moved from a pillow. I'm sure no one will know it's missing. The fiber is teased out and spread out so that it resembles long streaming water cascading down from the top of the waterfall. As soon as it touches the wire with the tacky glue, it holds immediately. Polyfiber is gradually added onto the aluminium to build up the body of the waterfall. To give it a dense, wet look, I'm using Woodland Scenics Realistic Water using a syringe. The realistic water is drizzled across the top of the falls, doing it slowly so the polyfiber soaks up the realistic water. The syringe can also be used to add water directly to areas of the waterfall that aren't getting the water as it naturally flows down from the top. To give the waterfall extra body, I use some of the Woodland Scenic Snow. The snowflakes are sprinkled across the top to fill in some of the gaps in the polyfiber and the snow will stick to the fibers that have been soaked in the realistic water. To reach the tight spots, it helps to add some snow onto a piece of paper and gently blow the flakes onto the front of the waterfall. If some areas of the waterfall need more body, you can easily repeat the process of adding polyfiber, realistic water and the snowflakes to gradually build up the waterfall. Some of the snowflakes will land in the excess realistic water that builds up at the bottom. These actually add a frothy water look, so I leave them there, but just tease them around into position that looks more realistic. The same is done up the top, however instead of the syringe, I used a fan brush to apply the realistic water. That way I had more control over the excess, resulting in much less excess water building up at the bottom of the waterfall. The rough water right at the base of the waterfall is made using Woodland Scenics ripples with the snowflakes added and mixed together. This mixture is applied directly to the base and built up to resemble very rough water around the base. It is also applied across the top to help blend the transition between the relatively calm flow of water at the top to the very rough water as it starts to launch itself over the edge. For the rough ripples emanating out from the base, I'm using some Woodland Scenics water ripples. However, I pour it out and let it sit for about an hour or so, so that it starts to set. After an hour, it becomes thicker and holds its shape much better after it has been applied. I also add a few spots of the ripples effect onto the cascading water to give it a few bits of glistening water that reflect in the light. The remaining water has softer ripples added by applying Mod Podge Gloss. While the gloss is still wet, an airbrush is used to push the wet gloss around creating smaller ripples across the surface of the remaining water. And the final effect is the mist around the base. This is made using some more polyfiber, teased out very thin and pressed down around the very bottom of the waterfall. The last major scenic detail are the trees. These trees are made using a variety of coarse turf applied to natural seafoam tree armatures. I use a variety of trees from Knock and Jofix. Each tree is tested in position and then once happy a small hole is made so the tree can be permanently positioned with a small drop of glue. This is repeated many, many times across the diorama. It's actually surprising just how many trees you need to create something that looks accurate. To improve the edges of the diorama, 
I'm using polycarbonate sheet. This is a thin 0.8 mm sheet and using the clear makes it easy to trace the contour of the terrain. The polycarbonate is just thin enough to cut with scissors. So that the paint will stick to the surface, it is sanded with a fine grit sandpaper. It's sanded on both sides as one side will be painted and the other will have glue applied. Before priming it's wiped down to remove sanding dust. Then it gets a coat of black primer. Polyurethane glue is used to attach them to the sides. In hindsight, this would have been much easier to do right at the beginning. Some foam is used to help hold the sides and allowed me to use clamps to press the sides tight against the diorama edges. After removing the foam, once the glue had cured, I filled in any gaps that remained around the edges with plaster of Paris. Unfortunately, I didn't get this on camera. The white areas are painted so they blend in with the rest of the terrain color. Using some dark gray paint, thin down into a wash. Once that had dried, some tan earth Vallejo paint is used to color match it to the rest of the dirt and rock color. The edges get a final coat of black acrylic paint using a roller. The roller really helps to avoid getting any visible brush marks and gives the diorama a professional look once dry. And the very last thing to do is to hot glue the bridge into place. And then blend in the walking path with some dirt texturing. This model was so much fun to build. Just like how much fun I had building this small river diorama as well. So if you want to continue the fun, be sure to click on the next video. Cheers and thanks for watching.